Right, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. Welcome to this uh, meeting of the Audit and Governance Committee. Uh, first, a couple of things that I'd like to um, announce is uh, Richard Kingston joined this committee recently, but he's sent his apologies for tonight because he had an other uh, engagement that he couldn't get. And Peter Thurgood has he's moved to another committee, so we've had a bit of a change around the membership. Um, apologies. I've had apologies from uh, and Andrew Wood. I spoke to him earlier in the week, and he said he was his workload was prohibitive. Um, Councillor Jason Jones and Councillor Sarah Daniels. Have you had any more, Jane? No, Okay, thank you. Right, um, the next item is uh, the minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, as I wasn't here, I'll pass it over to my. Happy to move them, Chair. Declaration of interest. Uh, has anybody got any interest to declare? No. No interest. Thank you. Well, I'm moving swiftly on to item number four, which is from our external auditors. Thank you. So, we originally planned to bring the audit findings report to this committee, but Due to some issues on the audit, which I'll run through in a moment, this is just an update on the progress of the audit. So we can turn to page four. This is sort of an overview of the progress made with the audit. And we began our field work in July. We have worked on site with officers, and I think it's been a great help across the board to really push forward on the work. There are, have been some more samples this year and some extra tests, which... Um, lost my train of thought which have been due to increased quality requirements. The, there is one issue on the audit which has come to light, and that is around the valuations of council dwellings. So JLL, who are the councillors' valuers, when we queried them on some of the sample items that we picked, they said that they came back and said that it was wrong and they would need to revisit their valuation report. Now, the error identified so far was about 0.2%. But due to the size of the council dwellings valuation, it only needs to be 0.3% and we're above performance materiality and 0.4% and it's material. So we need to wait for that revised report before we can really kick on and, and identify whether a change needs to be made to the accounts or not. I think we're expecting that report this week, but Stefan might be able to give more on that. We haven't identified any other material issues to date, but we're still working through some of the evidence that we're getting back from the officers. On this page, we also talk about value for money. So in line with the code, we uh, can produce the auditor's annual report up to three months after the date of signing the opinion. So we've got that plan for January 2023, and there is a, a letter to the chair later on in the report which sets this out. Page five onwards, we start to move into the significant risks that we reported in our plan and, and where we're at against those. So the first one is management override of controls. And we've progressed well on this area. We've got a few queries left on the journals that we've sampled. And we also need to review some movements between the general fund and the HRA. So we're just waiting for some explanations for those from officers. Page six is the valuation of land and buildings. Um, so aside from the council dwellings issue that I've just mentioned we're still challenging the valuer on sort of other land and buildings and investment properties so we've had some evidence back from the valuer and also from the council to help us with our sample but we're just going through that and there may well be more challenge that goes back to either party we also need to look at the assets not revalued um in year and determine whether that is appropriate not to value them Page seven then moves on to the net pension liability. So we've substantially completed our work in this area, but we're waiting for the letter from the pension fund auditor. And once we get that, we can finish that off. 
page A sets out the audit deliverables. So you can see on there that the audit findings report was due for this meeting. But I think we're planning now for November. I think there might be an extra committee going in in November. And finally, page 10, this is the letter to the chair regarding value for money and that we intend to deliver this report in January 2023. Happy to take any questions. Thank you for that. Um, yes, I have read the, uh, the update and I sat with Stefan earlier in the week. Um, it is quite uh, pleasing to see that you have identified a few areas of concern because that's what audit's about and that's what we do in this, this, this committee. Uh, one question I would ask, the sample that you've done, is it pro rata that's going to be wrong or do you think you need to increase the sample? So we don't know what the value error is going to be yet, so we can't say exactly how much we're going to test. Now the report will say, the revised valuation report will say this is what the value should have been and we will then increase our sample to determine whether there is any sort of other errors that weren't picked up from that the value hasn't changed obviously you know if, if you do start to see a trend of errors then we need to do more sampling to ch check where, where where it's all or not hopefully we won't find any more uh, regarding your comments about the assets and the asset value that's something that's uh, I've been speaking to Andrew Wood regarding uh, a longer term strategy for all the borough assets to say that they need an asset management plan strategy for every single one how we maintain them how we look after them who's responsible for them and that that should become uh, them. well you know that that's a valid point to be honest councillor cook uh, you know if for example we've got a little piece of land that's costing us i don't know 20 grand a year to keep mowed down and somebody wants to buy it it may be an option i'm not saying that you should uh, in theory get rid of any assets because once you've got no assets that's silly but you're right, it's something that we're going to be working on together over the next few months to, to make sure that our asset management audit strategy is right so we don't end up with shops that's been not managed for 30 years. So thank you for your work uh, and we look forward. We are having an extra, extra meeting in November, so may or may not be ready by then. If it is, great. If not, we'll do it in January. But we are open, as I've spoken to Joe earlier, to putting more meetings on. We want to try and level the workflow across the year so we're all nice and steady. That's, that's my plan, and I know these guys are right behind me. So, once again, thanks very much for that update. Any questions? Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. I um, assume when we say council dwellings, we're talking council housing. Um, obviously, I always take these valuations with a pinch of salt in reality because while we are required for accounting terms to put a valuation to it, a stock transfer or failed stock transfer in 2008 Tartars, actually our council houses are worth nothing because they have sitting tenants, uh, as we found out through the stock transfer process. That's not to say they're not worth anything. It just depends on how you want to look at it from an accounting perspective. A stock transfer showed they weren't actually worth anything with a sitting tenant because of the nature of social housing. But however, I do note it delayed one of the deliverable reports that was supposed to be due by the end of this month. Obviously, understand that, not attacking anybody. I just wondered, does that have any knock-on effects if we don't hit target on that report? So that report's the audit findings report, and that is the one that will be delivered in November. The statutory deadline is to issue an opinion by the end of November, and we should be okay to hit that, providing we can report the audit findings report in November. Uh, yeah, just obviously uh, pensions are mentioned, which has obviously been in the news today, so <laughs> obviously sets off everybody's hackles. Um, obviously, when you start seeing figures of a liability potential of 2.3 and another liability of 2.8 against percentages, that I'm going to be honest, I'm not an accountant, I don't understand. Can somebody just clarify what it is I shouldn't be worried about when I can see those figures? I do have a follow-up, but I'll save that for a second. Yes, um, if I could take that one. Um, it, the GT have put in their report that uh, they need to test uh, a number of uh, variations in the key assumptions. So what we've set out in our accounts is if, if there was a 0.1% decrease in the discount rate, what that actually would have the effect on, on the, our overall share of the pension fund. Uh, and, and it says, 
um, and these figures are provided by the actuary based on all the data within the fund, it would have an impact of £2.8 million. Pounds. Now, we're required by the code to actually set out um, these variations or sensitivity analysis is another way of, of talking about it, because if there was a, a, you know, a big change in that discount rate, then we could see an enormous change in the pension fund valuation. Now, this year, the pension fund valuation um, go, well, it goes up and down every year, depending on the, the you know the, the state of the, the financial market. Yeah, so it was uh, you know our deficit last year on the pension fund was 50 million or 52 million, I think, but it's gone down to just over 30 million now. So we've seen a, a significant change just because of the change in the underlying assumptions and the state of the the financial markets. Now, when we get to the end of this year, who knows what what, what it's going to uh, going to happen? But it could be. That we'll see that reverse back again at the end of this financial year. Thank you, Chair. So, yeah, just to follow up on the same question. Um, might not have much relevance here, but while my curiosity brains on, uh, you remember a few years ago, Steph, um, you just completed is it the biannual, triannual review of the pension part, and we nice, always throw a nice lump sum up front to get the total cost down. And uh, because it was then written into the budget papers, which I presented in this chamber, obviously, the then leader of the opposition was challenging me on pensions. I remember giving him an answer that we could actually meet 91% of our liability. I just wondered what the figure is at the minute. Because, I mean, it sounds awful, 91% of your liability, but actually we were one of the best authorities in the country at the time for that figure, believe it or not. So I just wonder where we were at the minute, Steph. Thank you, Chair. I haven't got the precise figure to, to hand, but I know the last time we looked at this, um, it, it had gone up from 91%, so it was probably 96 97% at the time. The triennial review is due again this year. It was due um, or as of March of 2022 to inform the, the pension fund contributions going forward from next financial year. So we should have an update later in the year on, on all of those percentages. But yeah, it was getting better. Uh, and obviously, we saw a big, a big um, benefit at the end of last, uh, you know, the last financial year because of the the increase in the underlying value of the assets. Now, um, who knows what's going to happen over the next few months? But based on the figures at the end of March, we sh we should see, you know, we could be over 100% funded at that stage. But that doesn't mean it's balanced um, because the pension fund actuary is quite clear that they do a, a forecast based on what liabilities the pension fund have got going forward and then what the, the uh, what income the pension fund and that do, they see it, it does see a divergence so that's why even we could be more than 100 percent funded but the future it would change so we still have to provide potentially more contributions going forward thank you chair uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can I just thank the 151 officer for that? It was a figure I monitored for many, many years, and you know, it always impresses me how this council is closer to its liability than many, and to hear that it's gone up from 91%, I'm incredibly pleased, and it, as long as it's in the right direction, I'm going to leave that there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Uh, thank you for, for that understanding. I mean, I, I too have just done the same for the business uh, pension fund, and, you know, they do three extrapolations of three, five, and seven percent of growth. Uh, and, and again, we, we do the same thing to, are we putting enough in? Are we not putting enough in? Can we have a holiday? Because you can. But it's all obviously driven back from the old uh, Maxwell days when the pensions were robbed. So um, it's good to hear that we're, we're on the ball. And it is a you know strategy now, isn't it? The, the, the financial people that you pension do have to tell you how you go. And good we are. So it's good to, thanks for the question here. Item five. Yes, um, just going back to, I've got a sidetrack there. I would like to record our thanks for where you are today with it. Thank you for your, 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 you know, the honesty. And I've read this myself this week with, with Stefan. It's good that we're picking up the th things like that. We need to know. We need to know good, bad, and indifferent, don't we? We don't, don't want to be hard. So it's, we are looking forward to November when it's all going to be hopefully reported. So thanks for your hard work. Now, do we have to move that? Can I? Yeah, well, I'd, uh, I'd propose that we move it. Uh, who's going to second it? Uh, okay. Vote. There you go. There you go. That's all, that's all good. All right, quickly on to item five, which is a review of the annual Treasury outturn and actual... 
credential indications. Thank you, Chair. I'll take this one. Um, as members will be aware, the, the Treasury Management Code of Practice requires that full council nominate an appropriate committee to scrutinise its Treasury Management activities. Uh, and the council approved that, that this committee, the Audit and Governance Committee, scrutinised the strategy policies as well as receiving the regular monitoring reports that we take also take to full council. Um, so with regard to ensuring effective scrutiny of the Treasury Management Strategy and Policies, the report outlines the code's suggestions. So it involves reviewing the Treasury Management Policy and procedures and making recommendations to the responsible body. Now that report comes to the committee earlier in the year um, uh, because it gets approved by Council in February. It's, it also says that organisations have a responsibility to ensure that those charged with governance have access to the skills and knowledge they require to carry out this role effectively. Obviously, we put on Treasury training on a regular basis for, for all members. It says those charged with governance have a personal responsibility to ensure they have the appropriate skills and training in their role. Uh, the procedures for monitoring Treasury management activities through audit, scrutiny and inspection should be sound and rigorously applied with an openness of access to information, as well as well-defined arrangements for review and implementation of recommendations for change. And that also includes the provision of monitoring information and regular review by both councillors in executive and scrutiny functions. And obviously we report to Cabinet, report to full council and to yourselves as a scrutiny. So in, in compliance with those requirements, the uh, the annual report on Treasury Management uh, Service is attached at Annex 1, as approved by Council last night. Um, so it's over to you. Uh, do you have any questions on the, on the, the report? It is uh, it's a statement of fact because it's reporting the actuals for the last financial year, or if you've got any suggested amendments, which would then go on to Cabinet uh, for, for recommendation. So over to you, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, that update. Um, you're right, I mean, we, we went through it last night. Uh, there's a bit good opportunity for all the uh, councillors to, to have a comment and a suggestion. I don't... Uh, oh, Mr Cook. Councillor Cook, please continue with your question. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, obviously, it's good news. I just want to fully understand it. Obviously, we budgeted to have 34.5 million in the actual Treasury, when we've actually ended up with 75.3, which is brilliant because we had a budget of income of 95% in interest and we ended up with 212. It's fantastic. Obviously, is the additional funds we're currently banking around the world um, basically because of capital slippage? So I just wonder if you could take me through what the slippage is. Yeah, obviously this relates to, to last financial year. So again, we've we've had slippage that slipped into this financial year, but this this relates to the previous year. So yes, we had about thirty million pounds worth of slippage in the capital program at the end of March twenty twenty one. Which I'm oh, sorry, March twenty, yeah, March twenty twenty one, because this relates to twenty one twenty two, um, which would have then meant our balances would have been up, were significantly higher than we assumed when we set the budget uh, so that's part of the reason part of the other the other part of the reason is that rates did start to increase towards the end of that financial year so we, we saw uh, an increase in rates from 0.1 percent if you remember base rate was as low as that um, to 0.25 probably by the end of March 2022 um, so they're the main reasons I don't have the breakdown of all of the capital slippage, but it's things like future high, the, the big ones, future high street fund would have been a big amount of slippage um, at the time. Um, Solway, um, Gungate, uh, and at that time, our investments in the property funds would have slipped as well, which is about eight million pounds, which we invested during the year. So that, that contributed to, to, to the higher level of balances. And of course, we, we also received significant levels of grants due to COVID that we then had to repay back at the end of that financial year. So uh, to do with business rates, for example. So we held on to those for a year almost and then had to pay them back. Um, so yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, 
Uh, just one more, really. I mean, obviously, I'll start by saying, should we make this the first meeting, Stefan? I don't, don't mock you about the CFR and what a pointless statement it is. <laughs> so we'll leave that one for one, shall we? Uh, yeah, my last question is, um, obviously, um, talking of property funds, when we first you know, went into using £12 million from the capital receipt from the golf course for property funds, the value for money statement said we could justify doing it because we would earn between 4 and 5% interest, which was our target. As we've done recently, because of economic conditions beyond the control of this council, it's dropped below as 3.2 on some. Uh, as the report, I'm trying to remember this off the top of my head, I wrote this down on my pad at work and forgot my pad. I think we got 369k in interest versus a budget of 300,000, if I remember the figure. Obviously, we what's going on economically around Britain, certainly at the minute, around the world, as interest rates are going to skyrocket, are we going to see a massive benefit, even though I'm expecting my mortgage to go up £700 a month? <laughs> the chair? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, investing that £12 million in the property funds, we've, we've seen a significant return, I've got the figures in front of me, actually, uh, of about 600 and fifty thousand pounds over the the period since 2018 and obviously we only invested eight million of that, that 12 million during last financial year um so that's quite a significant return well above what we would have earned um you know investing the interest at 0.25 percent through the the financial markets uh you know, probably near a four percent obviously it has been affected by covid over those over that period but we, we are expecting best part of 4% per annum return from those uh, property fund investments, which is more than we, we could have, uh, you know, the, it, investment returns, normal investment returns were 0.28%, as you've seen in the report, uh, reported last year. But what we've also seen over that period is a significant rise in, in the value of those assets. Now, obviously, we could see a reduction going forward, <laughs> But at the moment, um, it, it went up to about one and a half million pounds earlier this year that we'd actually seen that capital appreciation uh, in the council's funds. Now, that's only on paper because you don't realise that until you sell your assets. Um, and, and you'll remember when we, we, we had the, uh, the discussions around property fund investments uh, over, over a, a long term period, 10 years plus, you see a, a revenue return of four percent for four to five percent return on your investment but you also see a significant capital appreciation in property prices over that period so when you do sell your assets you've gained because you've had the re annual return from your interest but you also gain when you sell them because you've actually uh, you sell and, and, and realize that uh, that capital appreciation now you know figures over 10 15 years could be as high as 30 percent but it, who knows? It could be. It could be. It could be yeah. zero. No, it, it depends on the no, market. <laughs> At the moment, we're okay, but we'll see how what happens over the, the coming months and years. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can I just thank the one five one officer for justifying to the guy who gave him permission to do it in the first place? <laughs> well, I'd like to. Uh, well, actually, congratulate you and your team. That's a fantastic effort. It was well. You know, I wasn't around then, but that was a great bit of foresight to invest in that. I mean. Four or five percent is a, is a good return by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, so well done, you've done a great job. So can you minute that, please? That they've done a fantastic job.
There you go. You can talk now. Yeah, I just want to support what you're saying about, you know, levelling this out, Mr Chairman. Absolutely agree. A perfect example, if you look at what's in front of us, I think there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten items for the 27th of October. Obviously, with our monarch passing away, we had to move the state of the borough debate from the period it was in, and we'd have to put it where we could get it. But basically, we're asking members to prepare for a state of the borough debate, one of the biggest debates we have as elected politicians on the 25th of October, while people on this committee have also get, get ten days to wrap their head around all those items. I think that's a big ask. It really, really is, because preparing for the state of the borough debate is quite important, because it's where we debate what's right and wrong with our town, and it, it needs proper effort, not a bit of side thought or a bit of bad pollocking. It's so... If there is any way we can smooth that out and move any of those items, or even better, if any of these reports will be ready ahead of the 10 days, could we get them? Supporting, obviously, what you've been pushing for, Mr Chairman, because, like I say, with the State of the Borough debate the same week, it's going to be a big demand on the members of this committee, isn't it? Well, I'd like to come back on that. Uh, it's something that we, we are working on. It is work in progress. Joe, myself and the team, we're all looking at these things and saying, well, you know, can we? if there's any done early, ready early, we'll get them out of the way and done. So... It is something that we're looking at the scheduling. I spoke to Andrew and I spoke to Stefan uh, and obviously your team that uh, do the number crunching. So if they are they are early, then I'm sure that it's a work in progress and I'm sure we'll get better at it as time goes on. But certainly we, we that's that's the plan. So I'd, I'd like to thank you. Can you mean it that as well? But I thank the team for having a look at it and getting their head around it and changing a few things. Uh, Mr Chairman, you mentioned the possibility of a November meeting. I am very comfortable with the November meeting and I would be happy to delegate it to you and Andrew to determine which items you think should be moved to a November meeting if we can arrange one in accordance with people's calendars. Yeah. I'm looking, I'd happily move that as a recommendation I'll that, that yeah. um, because... I, I consider that the job of the Chairman, so I'm yeah. yeah, happy to support that. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, that's brilliant. I mean, Joe is already looking at it. Again, a November one come up because of your report, and that may be perfect timing, so we'll see, you know, depending there's too many, you know, ifs and buts at the moment, but that's certainly something that if we can get your report ticked off and out of the box, and, and maybe a couple of others, that, that great. I did speak to Andrew, uh, and I know that he's, he's got a lot of reports that he's doing now that will be imminent. So, again, we'll, we're going to schedule it. We'll sit down with you and uh, Andrew and... Uh, you know, over the next month or two, and we'll we'll get this sorted. So thanks for your support. Anyway, Danny, it's you know it's appreciated. I'm closing this meeting. It thirty-one minutes. Well done, everybody. So.